activate. Welcome to another special episode for the season 12 of Next Gen. Uh, this one being the Touring Cars and Clio review from the Monday Night Touring Car Package. Um, obviously, as we know, the Touring Cars very popular and the Clio's brand new to the Monday Night Touring Car Package. Now, we'll start off with the modern Touring Cars. And with me is Jack Millington, who uh, runs the Group A's and is a constant racer in the uh, in the moderns. Hello, nice to be here. And he, obviously he's known as Jack Team 53 Synopsis, if you didn't know. And also joining me is Lee Horn, otherwise known as NGR Ginge, who hosts both these uh, fantastic leagues. Good evening. I'll also add that um, Jack's also known as Chief Statter. Mm, there you go. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, Lee, a quick introduction for the moderns. Yes, um, well, it's been running since Project Cars 2 kindly gave it to us, because we didn't really have it with Project Cars 1, as uh, a lot of you be aware. There's only one touring car in the game, and um, it's been a raving success from the start, um, with obviously the multiple choices, more options, the Astra, and the GAN, the Beamer, and the... Help me out here, Jack. I can't remember the other one. Mercedes? Yes, the Mercedes. Yeah, indeed. Um, ever since I started running it on the Mondays, it's just been ever popular. And um, not quite got to two rooms, and sadly then I had to juggle reserves and, and the numbers around. But it's always been pretty much full every round, which uh, has been a real strong showing. And uh, they're very popular because I think there's a, there's a hell of a lot of touring car fans within the group that, that love driving the front wheel driving cars. But, uh, they're quick enough, but not super quick, and uh, it makes for very, very close robin racing. So, uh, yeah, updates from touring cars. Yeah, we said obviously this league put pits against front wheel drive and rear wheel drive because of the BMW, um, and. Always a very tight championship, it's fair to say. Uh, I don't think it's ever been absolutely dominated. No, it hasn't. Um, I must admit, the first season round, I had a rather good one, taking the <laughs> inaugural first round, uh, or first season championship, which I was uh, very pleasantly surprised with. But um, it wasn't a dominating season. I'd, well, actually, I say that. I've put some good stats together. Um, and I did, I did have a strong season, but um, since then, now that everyone else settled in, I think I'm maybe just settled in a bit quicker than everyone else because I was a, uh, I found some time back then, uh, a couple of seasons ago, to get a lot of practice in. But um, since then, in this uh, past two seasons, um, it's brought a lot of people to the sharp end and made it hugely competitive. So going in then. Um Let's have a little review of the first half of the season. It was always tight, uh, those first six races, those being Brands Hatch Indy, Spa Francorchamps, uh, Sugo, Imola, Long Beach, and Silverstone National. Um, all of them very, very tight and could have gone any, any way, really. Yeah, they were. Obviously, being the host. I obviously set the tracks myself, and after what was obviously a first successful season, I didn't want to do too much the same. But at the same time, I did feel that the tracks that I'd chosen made, you know, made good racing. So um, I, I tried to be selective again in putting tracks down that, well, yes, some of them were tight, they still produced really good, good races. Uh, the field didn't get too spread. There was still overtaking opportunities, and everything else. So. Um, that's just the, it wasn't really a hard and fast rule of selection of tracks, they're just trying to be openly selective to create good racing. Now obviously at, after round number six at Silverstone National, uh, Omega, who is the defending champion, was leading by 13 points from Scooby G and it was amazing the table to see, I mean literally 36 points covered the top seven after six rounds. It was phenomenally tight. It was, yeah. Um, I, I wasn't paying too much attention at that time because uh, for the first part of the season myself, I was 
struggling with performance. Um, Jack will probably be able to mention a bit more about how the rest of the field were doing, but I, I was aware that it was extremely close um, and tight, um, which, as the host, outside of personal performance, I was well chuffed with, because that's ultimately what you want to achieve. You don't want, really, you don't want people running away with it. You want people, lots of people, chomping at the bit to, to get up in that top positions and be close enough to, to battle for it. Was there any, uh, after six rounds, was there any particular drivers you were like, that's pretty standout performance so far? Personally, for me, I'd, I'd say Omega, considering we all knew what was going on outside of NGR racing. I mean, to be top of the league after six rounds, despite being as busy as he was with his balancing of work, race, life, and, for me, I was just like, wow, that's 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 really impressive. And the other driver, because obviously you said Long Beach was in the first six races, didn't we, Jordan? Then? Mm. I think you've got to point out Whitford with yeah. his victory at Long Beach. Because yep. for me, he was, I've said, I said the end of the review, he was driver of the season, despite the fact that he didn't win. Like, well, joint driver of the season <laughs> along with our champion but I'll mention that later he was in that BMW phenomenal yeah he was and, and I think he surprised a lot of people because um, he hadn't been a full timer going back too much he was sort of progressing and then he just all of a sudden then leapt up into that you know up at the sharper end I think he always had the skills to be but not necessarily consistency and he wasn't consistently turning up as well and then when he started go, get out of line and to have more time to race he was uh he was showing what he was made of and uh yeah it was impressive i i knew he'd be quick coming in to the championship because of the way he made an explosive impact in season 11 at rouen at group Hayes. but he did take a little bit more time to adjust to him in that bmw compared to the mcgann because we know that at some tracks the mcgann is and an advantage over the BMW. But when it's a little bit more closer, say it tracks like Algarve and Donington and definitely Long Beach, Josh, as is Whitford, can just pull something out of the bag like that. Especially the driver that he did at Long Beach was something else. He just drove off into the distance. Yeah, I mean, I'm inclined to agree. I mean, at that point, he was the top BMW. He was in the top five uh, with that rear-wheel drive car, which is almost unheard of with the amount of Megans that enter this series. Um, yeah, I mean... And one of in an Astra. Yes, <laughs> yeah. Well, actually, two at the start. Well, no, he's not an idiot. I am. <laughs> 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 um, but, yeah, I mean... Generally, obviously, Omega, brilliant start considering his work, work race balance, and also Whitford in the, uh, you'd have to say, the second best car on the grid. Yeah, definitely. But as we definitely, moved on... Feel... Sorry, go on. That's all right. My flight was short anyway. <laughs> <laughs> um, as we moved on through the season, though, the final tables shaped up to be quite an interesting one. Um, once I get up to them... <laughs> There they are. Um, yeah, I'll see the final six races. Snetterton 300, uh, Donington Park National, Laguna Seca, Algarve, Alton Park Island, and Ruapuna Park. And I'm just going to say this now. Whitford's drive at Ruapuna Park was fantastic, to say the least. It was an... Um, and I know Jack's going to complain now because I've just used that word. Um, but it yeah. was it was an unbelievable drive. Yeah, I mean, when we were commentating, because obviously you get joined you in the booth for the final race. Uh, it was just that was something that overtake you pulled on Boyrax going around the outside, and then setting the move up to the inside at the difficult, very tight right hander. Oh yeah, peak performance. That was that was definitely top form. And he just went off on his own, like just like at Long Beach, he controlled the race, drove off at his own pace, and no one could match him. 
No one could get within half a second of him apart from Boy Raxa. Bear in mind, this is a two time race of winners next gen champion. Couldn't keep up with this guy. To say that he was just one of the standout drivers of season of 12 would be an understatement. Um, Lee, I mean, is there any outstanding performances from the second half of the season for you? I mean, obviously, you, you had a bit of a better second half of the season your, yourself. Um, yeah, sa sadly, it was to the detriment of my Group A championship, though, because um, due to circumstances outside of racing, I, I just wasn't finding enough time to um, prepare myself for Monday nights. So um, something I had to give to to get myself put back, back on a let to find a bit more form. So um, yeah, I dropped the group A's and my second half was a million miles better. However, um, funny we're talking about Whitford and, and his, you know, what's been a, a very good season for him and his outstanding performances at times. But it was sadly me at Silverstone that pushed him back and, uh, and myself when we were, I think we were one and two at the time and I, I touched him and spun him round and waited for him to obviously get back on the track. Mm. But, um, so, I mean, yeah, we're talking about Whitford, and he's, he's, he's probably one of the main ones looking at the top table. Um, Martin, uh, he had some commitments, so he didn't race every race. Um, Jim didn't think he was on the best form that he's had in past seasons, but still can really, you know, consistent. I think, um, like I say, uh, outside of Whitford and Fraser, obviously he was just the man for the season. Um, what do you think, Jack? I, I, there's, there's two drivers there that... That you, that you, well, one that you've mentioned and one that I'm going to mention. Jim, and I mentioned this in the group age, Jim lacking a bit of speed in season 12, and it was, I think that was across the board, really. I know I think a few things, circumstances have changed in his life, but he was always there. He was just that driver that didn't make a mistake, very consistent. Just lacking that little, that final little push. He showed at Imola when he won that race. You don't have to be the fastest to win, and he wasn't. But his defence against Jamie was fantastic, as in the words of Jordan. <laughs> it was brilliant. He really was superb, and I've got to give him credit for that. The other driver, who we haven't amazingly mentioned yet, is Scooby. It's because. If he hadn't have been an idiot, he very, very likely would have been in front going into the final round rather than behind. But mm. obviously things happen outside of your racing life that you have to go and follow in some people's cases. <laughs> Let's put it in a nice way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, um, no. yeah, to be fair, we have overlooked Scooby, albeit I think it's quite easy sometimes to overlook him because he is... I don't think he's ever really that bad, and and it's only an outside influence like not turning up <laughs> because of other things that actually yeah. put him back. Because we all know Jeff, he, he's 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 mad for it, always on. He's very highly skilled, a brilliant driver, um, and the normally brilliant driver, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and he, and he annoyingly turns up saying he hasn't practiced and sticks it on pole, and then oh I've done no practice, and then wins the race, and and but we love him to bits, and um, we do. Yeah. It's, that's just... right, no. Scooby, definitely. Obviously, we've mentioned Wither quite a lot, but there is one drive I really want to mention in this second half of the season, and it came from Donington National. And, Lee, you will know this very well. Um, when Martin won Donington National, and it was just a crazy race. I mean, you had Omega, who had probably one of the worst races of his next-gen sim racing career. Yeah. Um... And you were at the front lane, Martin uh, and Boy Raxa were going at it, hammering tongs through the Craners, through McLean's, Coppice, Fogarty S's, you name it, they were going hammering tongs at it. And you actually missed out on a first win of the season, because Martin just managed to get you. It was a phenomenal drive from him, in, in my opinion. Well, it, yes, Martin was extremely consistent. Uh, however, to, uh, <laughs> to just set the record straight, um, Martin had a coming together, I think, with Jim at the bottom of the craners, which allowed me to take the lead. But the three of us were all 
hunting like mad at each other. It was an amazingly tight race. So I felt I was gifted to lead. And then I, while they were battling, kept a gap and was nice and calm. Got to the last lap and realised Martin would, had gained a little and was just applying the last couple of laps pressure. When I, um, I think it was, I just don't think, I don't think it was the first corner, it might have been the was second Was it Old corner. Hairpin? Um, no, no, it was up the top before coming down the craners. I put a, I put a wheel along the last lap on the grass. Uh, a, a red um, gate, a, red gate a in Hollywood. Very, yeah, a very big, uh, to me, to you, and then nearly around, managed to save it and uh, passed. Martin sailed past, and I thought it was, to be fair, justified that he got back in front, albeit I was gutted to throw it away, because I should have held it and, and taken the win myself. But, yeah, I sat and obviously managed to get back in, suck up behind him, but then I wasn't, I wasn't going to get past, he wasn't going to make another mistake. So, yeah, it was an amazing race. For me, it was my best, one of my best results. And um, But it was a brilliant race just to be in the thick of it. But, yeah, Martin, Martin um, he's always there or thereabouts. And I think, like Jim this season, um, Martin in the past, and even up to the current times, he had a lot of bad luck. Um, a, a lot of things not go his way when it's come to mini incidents and, or... Or he, circumstances that have happened in front of him. He's been so unlucky. Yeah. The last, last two seasons, ever since he first took part. I think, I think he, he had the record for the most amount of pole positions without taking a win. He hadn't won until Donington. And mm. when I seen that he crossed the line that he'd won, I've never been so happy in my life for someone else winning a race. Because he, like I mentioned, yeah. he's been so unlucky. He, Mm. He got, I think, Imola two seasons back. He was on for the win, and then he got caught up in an incident, like two laps from the end. It's been other races like that. He's been punting off at the star. He's always been quick. He's just had a lot of bad luck, or he's put a little wheel wrong. And it's weirdly ironic that he's won a race after being punted and having a mistake with him in Boy Raxa to then have the leader make a mistake. Yeah, I said it was Jim, didn't I? Yeah, sorry, you were right. It was it, it was Ben. Because um, it was us battling at the front there, I remember now. But, yeah, to be fair, Martin, I've, I've talked with Martin quite a bit, uh, obviously on my messenger and stuff, because um, mm. we've been close rivals, because we've been going back to the first season, and then the clears as well. We've, we've always been, been uh, quite competitive, friendly rivals against each other, and um, he had a, he really went through a bit of a lull. Um, his wheel wasn't performing right, he was getting different on our feelings. He lost all his confidence. I kept trying to sort of G him up, and eventually it's come back around. Um, and I was really pleased that things started to improve for him. I don't think they're at their best point. I still think there's loads more improvement, and you'll see a lot more of mine. He signed up for a full seasons again. I think um, he's going to be a force to be reckoned with. Uh, I think I think the the best thing he did was to move from the Astra, because when I and I'm blowing my own trumpet a bit here. When I put it on third on the grid at Imola, and he was down in, I think he was ninth or tenth, and I, he was about three seconds off me, and I, but he must have just thought, no, nah, not doing it anymore. He must, I must, I'm, I don't want to be horrible in any way, shape, or form, but he must have just thought, no, nah, that, that can't be right. I've got to change car because that Astra is very, very difficult to drive and I think as much as I love driving it and as much as Martin enjoyed driving it it's just not good enough and I think that must have hurt him in his head to go in no I've got to be in a battle car more competitive car yeah he spoke mm. to me about it and said look can I change and I said look I've got absolutely no problem with you changing I said don't don't even worry about it the, the car is just not competitive and um, it ain't helping you in, to put yourself back in the right place and mm. um, Obviously, I offered you the same change suit. But we're not like we were. Uh, you, you guys were in like championship competing pos you know, positions, uh, and if you're not having any fun out of it, and everyone's passing you down the straights, I mean, I, I wouldn't want anyone to sit in a car that's just getting overpowered. Even why do you want to feel like Jason Player, eh? <laughs> 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 big dig, big dig. <laughs> you know, um, I don't mean as in Jason Player, but I mean as in the past. They, people were passing those Subarus down the straights. Yeah, and and and, and going, you know, it's just an example. It's not a big education, of course. So by the yeah, end of the season, need to sponsor touring cars, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> uh, by the end of the season, though, 
Fraser won his first title, and it's a surprising fact, you know? I mean, considering the, the titles he actually possesses, obviously before going into this, he was the Renault Esports finalist. And yet he'd not he not yet won a title at next gen. It was I tell I found that quite a phenomenal fact. Well, the thing with Fraser, and obviously known him from since I've been around right from the start, and he's gradually progressed in his skills, and he's learned, and he's watched, and he's taken on board, and he's and I think everything culminated in this last twelve months uh, with his skills, with a, with his luck, with his performances. Um, the dedication and time that he's been putting in, and the, uh, and oh, I'm over the moon for him, and absolutely, you know, chuffed to bits because he's deserved everything he's got this season, and he's got a lot because he's worked hard for it, and he's um, he's a shining example to all because he's um, he's ticking on a bit now, like myself, and <laughs> <laughs> and um, it, it's he's he's just he's just phenomenal. I can't congratulate him enough, and I, and I know how chuffed he is as well. So. Um, yeah. He, uh, he also has a bit of a new toy to his rig as well, doesn't he? With the uh, after winning the next gen Thrustmaster Rallycross competition. Uh, he's going to be in the D1 Drifters League now, isn't he? For sure. Yeah, I mean, it's a <laughs> proper handbrake on the car, um, or even use that as a sequential gear shift. But it was a, again a, a brilliant title to really watch again. Um, and I think it's going to just get tighter and tighter every season this league continues on. Indeed. Yeah, I think everyone's skills are improving, everyone's learning. Um, everyone, I think, then gets a bit more competitive, especially as the seasons roll on and you get more experience in the cars. Some decide, you know, they fancy a change of car and they perhaps test it and some do change. Others um, sticking with what they know and thinking I want to I want to try and compete for the number one spot this time and then um, yeah year on year season on season it's um, should I say because we have plenty of seasons in a year <laughs> so season on season and it, the competition seems to get stronger and stronger and that's uh, mm. that's really good that's what we want and some idiots will be back in a proper car <laughs> <laughs> now we're going to go to the Statman corner and also motorsport journalist uh, Jack you have a few driver reviews to tell us. I do, I do, and we've we've mentioned Fraser, we've mentioned Martin, so I'm not going to talk about those two because we've given them enough praise. However, I am going to talk about if I can find his stats, the man who finished second in our. Touring Car League this season. Mr. Scooby G's season review. He had an average finishing position of 2.9, the lowest ever seen in the TC League, and yet Scooby somehow didn't win the title. In the 10 races that Jeff took part in this season, he only finished lower than 6th once at Donington Park, which was that crazy race that me and him got involved in an incident in. His start to the season, though, was as good as Fraser's. In the opening four rounds, he took a victory at Spa, where he dominated, just like he did in the Group A's in the earlier race that evening, and he had podiums at Brands and Imola. He had the championship lead, going into Long Beach, but he disappeared for personal reasons. But despite that, he still didn't lose his title lead. He had another podium at Silverstone, and then he had another victory at Laguna Seca, a brilliant drive from 10th on the grid to finish 2nd at Algarve, left the championship all pleased going into the final two races. Jeff annoyingly missed the race at Alton Park and saw an 8 point lead turn into a 13 point deficit and the damage was done. His poor qualifying at the championship finale in New Zealand meant he couldn't push through the field and the championship slipped away from him. Aside from the incidents and an out of sorts drive almost at Dyington Park, Scooby's racecraft has been phenomenal and it's obvious he's exceptionally fast, which is why it's surprising to see that Jeff didn't get pole position during season 12. Maybe the 5 minute qualifying format meant that Jeff couldn't get the speed quickly but only he will know the real reason. Jeff could have been season 12 champion but those two races he missed counted against him, however he'll go again in season 13 and he'll be challenging for the title once more. 
Yeah, definitely an interesting season for Scooby. Obviously, should it's almost like a should of, could of, would of situation. Mm. But um, in the end, a runner-up spot still not bad. No, not at all. Not at all considering. Who's next on your hit list, that man? <laughs> I'm going to select a driver that we haven't actually spoke about in the TCs, but we did in the group A's. And that is Jamie. 430. So it's been a good debut season for Jamie in the TC League. Despite not winning a race and a bit of bad luck, that actually stopped him from achieving one race win. The opening three rounds were a bit of a hit and miss for Mr. Dory. Huge spin at Brands half. Hatch, rather, left him in the gravel trap and as a result he finished in 11th. Drove wonderfully at Spa though, despite the tricky wet conditions, Jamie managed to score his first podium of the season. Sugo, he had probably the battle of the season as he scrapped hard for 7th place between NGR Ginge, who's currently in the Wobby with us, NGR Martin, who was in the Astra at the time, and me, the man who managed to get past him for 7th place at the end. His best chance to win a race came at Imola, where despite leading for most of the race, Jamie made an error which allowed our Jim to slip through, and despite his best efforts, he couldn't find his way past. The fellow Madrak McGann driver, and he had to set up for second. He struggled for form over the next three races, though, after being bullied at Long Beach, he then struggled with pace at Silverstone, qualifying in the lower reaches of the top 10. To make matters worse, at Snetterton he had crashes, and at Donington he was spun off at Turn 1 with an incident of a BMW, which left him languishing down in 8th. Jamie showed better pace at the following two rounds, and he would have been on for a podium at Laguna Sega, had slider gas not caused the most spectacular crash ever seen in the next gen race which Jordan missed out on the bloody stream <laughs> <laughs> sorry Jamie <laughs> no, I'm sorry I'm looking at the wrong stat there but despite that he was able to come back through the field he did the same thing in Algarve and he fought through all the way to get his final podium season sadly two difficult races at Alton Park and we were a pony stifled his progress and because of that he was overtaken by Whitford Zero for third place in the championship. Jamie's had a lot of bad luck this season and that stopped them definitely from at least winning one race. If his luck changes for season 13, then expect him to win a few races this season. Yeah, a very good debut season for Jamie. Um, without the doubt, I mean... He, he doesn't like the touring cars, I know that for a fact. Um, and he's going to be a contender for season 13. I think so. I think so. It is a shame that crash was missed, though. <laughs> I hate to bring that up. I can't it remember what I was watching at the time, either. You were watching the battle between the front two, I think. Ah, uh, yes, I was, because that was, that was getting quite it interesting, the battle of the front. A mother and father of the shunt. I'll have to find someone's um, live stream for that and have on Mr. Dory's camera and uh, see if I can have a look at it. Um, and who's your final driver review going to be? My final driver is not Tim. It's actually his title rival. <laughs> yeah, obviously... Shadowstalker VBS. Before, before you read this one, obviously, probably one of the... It's actually a highlight of the season, actually, for me. Uh, which I did forget to mention was Tim and Shadowstalker DBS. I mean, they never at, they're never at the front. Let's be honest. I mean, uh, as harsh as it is, it's about it's brutally honest. And they're, they're not at the front, but they have some of the most gigantuan battles. And sometimes they're actually more interesting than the race leading. Yeah, you're not wrong. You're not wrong at all, I think. After watching the, the past streams myself, watching those two make mistakes, and it's generally clean as well. I mean, if there is a crash between them, it's not 100% an accident. It's never intense. There's never, they always give each other enough room. And, and they've been phenomenal to watch. You really have. But I will crack on with this review. While well, there's been a title battle, at the sharp end of the field during season 12, there's been an equally fierce battle at the back between Shadowstalker, as we've mentioned, and NGR Tim. 
After missing the first round, Owen took to the grid at Spa, where, despite the difficult conditions, he was actually able to beat one high mofo, despite driving the Mercedes, which has clearly been the slowest car in the grid. From there on in, Mr. Baldwin tended to qualify around 10th place due to setting our lap time during a short qualifying session, whereas others usually don't. But the battles between him and Tim started at Sugo, where Alan and Tim were battling quite hard for a number of laps before Tim slid off the road, which was the corner before the long back straight. It was a good race for Alan, however, as he beat a number of drivers to record 13th place. There was actually 16 drivers in that lobby, he beat four others, actually no, three others rather. Alan might not have been fast due to the Mercedes, because that is a very difficult car to drive, but he was exceptionally consistent, with no huge crashes or big mistakes through the season, and thanks to his battles with Tim and then Bill Extreme, let's not forget him when he was able to race, his race pace started to improve, seeing him edge closer to the midfield battle as the season drew on. There was, however, one incredible moment at Algarve. The Mercedes <laughs> was clearly the slowest car on the grid, even slower than the Astra. But thanks to Alan being able to set a clean up, he started sixth. Sixth place. His highest ever grid position in the TSA League. What followed was an absolutely monumental scrap between him and Tim, which was actually highlighted during our commentary at the time, and it was a joy to watch. A little mistake though gave Tim the victory between the two of them, and a one second penalty didn't help as well due to track limits. An 8th place start position at Alton Park went unrewarded as he disconnected after having a crash with Tim, which was genuinely an accident because they were battling for 10th place at that point. And then the showdown at Ruapuna was settled early on as Tim retired from the race and Alan won there championship battle at the bottom of the table although interesting point to note they weren't actually bottom either of them for the full time championship but I'll mention that later on Alan won the battle though between himself and Tim and showed some good racecraft and speed in the slowest car but, and it is a question how fast would he be if he drove them again in season 13 always big questions but yeah, I agree. I mean, in in reality, a very good season for Shadow Stalker with the battling he's done, the pace improvement. You you couldn't really ask any more of him, really, um, other than to just keep battling Tim, um, because I, in theory, that I reckon that's what keeps Tim and Envoy Extreme going in these sorts of championships is having that one person, even if it's just one, just to have a massive battle with. But we, we shall see next season, because he, I, I believe he's back um, for, for next season. And, yeah, it'll be interesting to see if he stays with his Mercedes or switches to them again. Now, I don't know if or he even is... the Astra. Even the, well, yeah, even the Astra. I mean, potentially even the BMW. I mean, <laughs> yeah. I mean, even, even if you switch to the BMW and got used to the rear-wheel drive, um, it would be an interesting insight. Now, I don't know if Lee is still with us at the moment. I am, sorry. Ah, uh, there he is. So, another element of the touring car this season was this time you had a f there was a full season of commentary rather than just half a season, because obviously I came in uh, halfway through season 11 in the end, um, after some external things shifted around. How... Now, I, I, and Jack will say this, I posed, I posed a similar question to him on the group A's. Um, how much does it impact and affect and ultimately help the touring car league to have that streaming and commentary? Um, personal opinion, I think it's brilliant. It's a lot more exposure. Um, it gets others interested from outside. I get comments from friends and I like the odd comment from people that I don't know um, saying that they've seen the stream and said how cool it looks the racing and this that and the other. Um, and I, 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 you know, you, I'm going to give you a big head but you do a great job um, in, in what you do for us um, which is all, all volunteer in your own time and um, it's fantastic. Um, if 
if we could have someone like you doing every league, it, it would be a bonus, um, and it would be brilliant. But um, there's only one of you, and you obviously you only have so much time, and what you do do is uh, is invaluable, I think, and um, we're very appreciative of it. So. 100%. Now, Jack, I asked you at the start of the season, because I, I obviously read your reviews from season 11, and you remember me asking you, can you do me a review? Even though I'm not racing on commentary, can you do a review on my commentary? Well, I can do. And you have. <laughs> and I will do. <laughs> um, you can take it away. Well then... This is effectively JPH 99's commentary season review. Jordan Harden heading did to his first full season of commentating on the Monday Night Tours after commentating on the second half of season 11, and he's done a good job. Rather, he's done a great job. Jordan has quite a unique voice and commentating style, unlike the mad ravings of David Croft and the random explosions of excitement of Ed Edwards. Jordan delivers his commentary in a calm and insightful manner, which brings out the racing in a new light. There were some moments which were particularly enjoyable. His deliverance during the four-way battle for 7th for Sugo in the TC League was a delight, as he balanced his personal views and technical insight brilliantly, as well as the battle for the win between MG Oscar UG and Cam Monte Free Desert Silverstone National in the Group A Taurus. It can be difficult however, trying to balance commentating and directing, and Jordan did miss a few moments, such as the big mench, big pile up that I mentioned earlier at the beginning of Saker, and the last last, last lap mistake from NGR Ginge, which gifted NGR Martin his first win. Naturally though, Jordan ballots out praise to those who deserve it, and it's nice to hear those who deserve recognition get it. Although if Jordan can use some new words alongside his favoured, fantastic and brilliant, that'd be great. <laughs> When he has commentated alongside someone, though, having a co-commentator, however, Jordan has bounced off them through it. When Phil joined as a guest co-commentator, Jordan clearly worked well with him. But his duo with myself for a few rounds at the end of season 11, season 11 and season 12 has shown that he can elevate his own performance even more. Jordan has been the most important addition to the MNT races, and no doubt he'll be a fantastic commentator for the next-gen community again in season 13. And I must add that Jordan also commentates on the Emily Lynn Scott sponsored Geneta GT5 League. Yeah, and I tell you, I really do thank you for doing that because it's always interesting for me because to me that's like feedback. And I will warn you, I don't like to brag about anything I do, but it is to me, to me it's really nice to have some sort of comp like you two going on. It's brilliant, it's brilliant because it. It inspires me to do it, and continue to do it, and, in my opinion, if there's anyone else out there that wants to do commentary, just go for it. Go get a league that you that needs commentary in your stream, and just do it. it. It's a fantastic, fantastic thing to experience. And I mean, I literally, and I've said this many times to you two, I'm sure, this was more of a bucket list thing for me to do. I thought, I want to go and commentate on a race at some point, because I've always wanted to do it. And lo and behold, I've loved it so much, I'm <laughs> doing about three different leagues. Um, no, it's, it's enjoyable to watch, that's for sure. And Jack, I do thank you for doing that review um, on your own time. No problem, not at all. Um, oh yeah, and I'll be asking for another one for season 13. <laughs> no way. <laughs> um, so finally, to wrap up this touring car review, um, Lee, give us your general review of the season. Uh, overall? Uh, Just successful. overall. Yeah, overall, very successful, competitive. Um, I think the key thing was fun. I think there's, there's, you're always in any league, any time you're going to have the little lows, where there's, there's a few incidences and a couple of people get their nose out of joint. But overall, um, the greases always get ironed out everyone always settles back down and ultimately everyone comes out of the side with uh, with, a, you know, with some sweaty grins on their faces after some competitive racing so uh, long may it continue and I'm sure it's just going to only get better um, but the, yeah this last season has uh, been an improving one for a lot and uh, successful, very successful product 